I'd like to uh, welcome everyone this morning. I hope all was well uh, with you and your family. And, you know, just in a short amount of period of time, of three weeks ago, uh, the economy was good, uh, employment was at an all-time high, and, and then if you could go back in time and say in three, three weeks it'll be wiped out, you'd probably think well, he's crazy. But in that time, it's, it's, it just goes to show you on how fragile man is. But I hope all is well with your family. And I know these are trying times and difficult times for everyone, but I got good news. God is still on the throne. He's on the throne before, He's on the throne today, and he'll be on the throne when this is over. One day, you know, time passes. Things happen, but things never last forever. So, as this passes, we, we have to learn from our mistakes. We have to learn who we are. And give God the glory. Because through this, even though God didn't create it, people talk, well, this is from God. It's a sign of a time. It's not from God. It's I believe that he uses things. He uses what's happened in the world. And he turns it into glory. Now, the Bible talks about end times and, and times that are very similar to this. And I think that we need to heed this as a probably warning, because if you if you look at it, and the Bible talks about pestilence and, and and things of that sort, and you're thinking, well, this is what we're going through. This is something, but it'll be far worse later than it is now, because there's one thing that's going to separate what will happen then and what happens now is that we still have mercy. We still have God. We still have the church with us. Because when these things happen, the, God's going to shout and he's going to take his children home. But we're still here. Even though the church doors are open, or, or they're closed now, we're still here. We're still the church. The church building does not make the church. The church people makes the church. We are the body of the church. And it does my heart good when you start seeing uh, on social media that there's a high increase of uh, churches streaming their lessons, the, the revivals. Uh, his word is probably getting spread more locally now than it ever has been and we're seeing people saved so even though it's hard and it's difficult for families and it's a trying time his glory will still shine through and it's we all have to do our part we all have to be the church because people are looking for answers. People people who don't understand and who are searching for God are looking for you. And you can be that person. Because um, we need to upbuild the church. We need to show that God is still on the throne, that his mercy still stands, that there is ample time for you to make Jesus Christ your Savior because it's one thing to go through time these times knowing that you're a winner either way that no matter what happens that you're a child of the King but it's a lot diff more difficult to go through these times when you have you don't have that hope when you don't have that sense of uh, I'm a winner either way because it, it I can imagine it would be difficult. It, it could be scary. And people are looking for that hope. People want something to hold on to. 
And we got to share the gospel. We got to tell them how good he is for uh, that he's all mercy. And that these are the times when you that people look to, toward him and they need, need him. And we got to explain how and give them direction on how to get him. But for my lesson today, it's titled The Lowly King. And it's found in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 17. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, the king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Here we have in verse 9, well, actually I want to take you back to verse 8 to lay a small foundation. And in verse 8, it says, and I will encamp about mine house because of the army, because of him that passeth by, and because of him that returneth, and no oppressor shall pass through them any more. For now I have seen with mine eyes. In verse 8, the uh, Bible scholars say that Zechariah is prophesying Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great was going through at the time, uh, going through the Mediterranean and he was uh, conquering city after city after city. And when people would hear of Alexander the Great, they feared because they knew that they could be the next city to go down over his reign. But when he got to Jerusalem, he passeth by. He didn't take Jerusalem. He went around it. And Zechariah was prophesying this. Well, in verse 9, he says, Rejoice, O greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. This is a, just a poetic uh, reference to the people. He said, Thy king cometh unto thee. He is just. And when Zechariah is uh, re referencing the king, he's, talking, uh, he's referencing Jesus Christ. And as we know, Jesus was just. He was perfect in all way. He was uh, born of a virgin. He had no sin. He died on the cross. And on the third day, he raised. That's the whole foundation of our uh, belief, that he was perfect, that without sin, and that he had to be the ultimate sacrifice for all of our sin. He says, and, and having salvation, which through his resurrection gives us the salvation that we have hope that if we accept him, that we have that hope that we'll make it to heaven and be with him forever. But he said, he'll come as a lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, when Zechariah was prophesied in this, this was 500 years before Jesus was born and we find uh, we find it in Mark and Matthew and John that they told of the story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem a week before his crucifixion riding upon an ass and the people would have uh, palm uh, leaves and they were waving them and putting them at the foot of the donkey and as he traveled and came into the city and they were yelling uh hosanna hosanna and hosanna uh, represents save us or save now and this was fulfilling the prophecy that zachariah had uh, told us right here so here you have zachariah 500 years prophesying that a man the king would come in riding a donkey and then we find it in the new testament that he did just that. So that prophecy was fulfilled. And in verse 10, it says, And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, 
and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Zechariah gets a little confusing because he skips he skips around, and Zechariah goes from the point that he comes into Jerusalem to the next verse is that he's coming on his second coming and he will be on his second coming. He will be victorious. He will come for his church. Uh, just like the prophecy in verse nine was fulfilled. He's going to fulfill in verse 10. And it says, as for thee also by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. This symbolizes a helpless pit in Babylon. The dry, the dry pit or cistern symbolizes the helpless situation they'd experienced in Babylon. So here he's telling them that you have a chance to go back to Jerusalem. The dry pit or cistern symbolizes the helpless situation they had experienced in, in Babylon. Uh, Cyrus was the person God used, but the basis for their release was the blood of God's covenant with them. The prisoners had to be given hope to return to the stronghold, which was that could be interpreted as Jesus or Jerusalem. So he's given them a chance to return back to Jerusalem. So on verse 12, it says, Turn you turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. He said he blessed them twice. Now you go back to Jerusalem to the stronghold, to where God wants you to be, and he would double unto thee. It says, when I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. So he's, in, in this verse, it says, when I have bent Judah, which is the southern kingdom of uh, Jerusalem, and then filled the bow with Ephraim, which is the the arrow uh, is the northern kingdom and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. Zechariah is prophesying in a different time period. This is the time period that's in between the Old and the New Testament. This is after Alexander has uh, passed away and Antius IV attempted to force Greek culture and religion on Jerusalem people. So he's telling them that the southern kingdom, which is Judah, and Ephraim, the northern, would be the arrow, and that when he would unite both the north and the south and of uh, people in Jerusalem, that they would go against the Greek. And with them combined, they would be a mighty sword. And the Lord shall be seen over them and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet and shall go with whirlwinds of the south and the Lord of hosts shall defend them and they shall devour and subdue with sling stones and they shall drink and make a noise as though wine and they shall be filled like bowls and as the corners of the altar and the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign up upon his land. For how great is his goodness, and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young man cheerful, and the new wine the maids. And all the, through these verses here, it's describing that the Israelites had victory over the Greek, which they did. And it describes the victory that Israel would have. We have that same victory today. When there's going to be a second coming, and during that second coming, that's our victory. That's when we'll, we'll celebrate with our 
King and our Savior Jesus Christ. And we'll we'll sit at a table feast with our God that no man could even fathom. I know that through these times uh, we like to lean not into our own understanding, but to God. Um, this has been a short lesson, and I hope, like I said in the beginning, that everybody is doing well and that we're here for each other, we're here for our community, and we must uh, pray for our nation, that our leaders would use wise decisions and put God first, because during this time, time period and our trial and our our hardships God's going to come through he's going to make himself known his glory is, is going to shine and like little Isaac says in church God is good all the time and if there's one thing that we can keep that in our heart that God is good all the time even in the bad times even in the hard times God is still good. He's still our God. And we like to put we like to pay attention to when during the good times uh, and not the bad. But when the when the bad times hit, that's when people want to look to the church. Well, the church doors are closed. So we need to be the church. We need to go out into the hedges and the byways and preach the gospel. We need to be the inspiration. We need to tell the people who their savior is and lead them to Christ because the world is going to be filled with gloom and doom. We got to give the people hope. People has to have the hope that they are, there's something better than this. And as we go through this world and through the days, the man is going to let you down. The world's going to let you down. And I, I hate to be gloom and doom, but in, during during the final days, it's going, it's, it's going to get worse. But that's, this is the time and opportunity. God, I believe that God has seen this is what's happening, and it's a wake-up call. I believe he's using this to, to open the eyes of many, and we've got to be there for him. I hope that, uh, that you got something out of this lesson. I hope that it helps you. Um, and if you don't know the Lord, I beg you to, uh, to accept him. Because it's so nice to have the hope and the salvation to lean on. Uh, I think of friends uh, and co-workers that I work. I, I, I don't want to see none of them perish or go to a devil's hell. And it would uh, honor me if any of them would ask for my help or my guidance or, or direction. And it would be an honor. But as we look at each other, you know, I think we, we we can't just focus on a sinner. We gotta we gotta be proactive as a Christian. We as Christians we all have friends and family and loved ones that are unsaved. So if they're not getting the message, then we gotta give them the message. We gotta put them in our prayers. We gotta start talking to them. We gotta start pushing the issue of hey. Do you want to make, do you want to accept Jesus Christ? You want to make heaven your home? Because it's a perfect time and opportunity. The fields are white and the harvest is plenty. And I think right now with the world slowing down long enough for man to sit there and think about what he's doing. Slow enough to where he can hear God. There was a time in my life that I didn't hear God. I didn't hear his calling. I wanted to accept God when it was on my terms. 
I want to say, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm settled down. I, I have a wife. I, I, I've got a, a, my first kid. I'm ready to uh, start living right. But there was no calling. And I was scared. I was, I was actually afraid that, you know, God only has to call you one time. If you're called more than that, then you're blessed. And I wasn't getting the call. And here I am thinking I'm ready, but God wasn't giving me the call. Finally, I got the call. And I heeded his call. I beg of you, don't run from him. Heed his call. If, if the Holy Spirit is pricking your heart, accept it. Today is the day of salvation. I want to thank you and uh, hope you enjoyed this lesson. And I will hopefully see everyone at church soon. But if not, everyone is in my prayers. Thank you.